morning, everyone. Can I welcome you to the 18th meeting in 2014 of the Infrastructure and Capital Investment Committee? Can I remind everybody to switch off their mobile devices as they do affect the broadcasting system? Um, some committee members may be uh, consulting their papers on tablet because um, we do provide the papers on digital format. Um, agenda item one is item in pri private. Can I seek the agreement of the committee to take item three in private to allow the committee to consider its work programme? Is that agreed? That is agreed. Thank you. Uh, agenda item two is homelessness in Scotland. Um, today we're going to hear evidence from the Scottish Housing Regulator as part of the committee's follow-up to its 2012 homelessness commitment inquiry, which we undertook in 2011-12. Representatives of the Scottish Housing Regulator join us today and its recent report on housing options ties in closely with the areas the, committee's, the committee hopes to explore in the coming months. So can I welcome Michael Cameron, Chief Executive, and Christine McLeod, Director of Regulation, Governance and Performance of the Scottish Housing Regulator. Um, would either or both of you like to make some opening remarks? Christine. Good morning. Um, just to, to thank the, the committee for the invitation to, to speak uh, to our recent housing options thematic inquiry and to give evidence to the committee. Very briefly, um, we would want to highlight that our board selected housing options uh, as the subject for the, for the Scottish Housing Regulator's first thematic inquiry, not only because our, our statutory objective um, includes protecting the interests of people who are homeless or who may become homeless, um, also because the achievement and sustained achievement of the 2012 target has been an important focus of our regulation of landlords for, for some years. We also recognise that housing options had been promoted as a key way for, for landlords uh, to deliver on that target and because there had been quite um, a range of views expressed just about, about how effective housing options was. Our board also took into account this, this committee's recommendation that SHR work with colleagues in the Scottish Government to ensure that services delivered by a housing options approach are consistent across Scotland and that local authorities are meeting their legislative duties. So the thematic inquiry was designed to also address the, the committee's recommendation. I think it's important to, to say that housing options is widely recognised as a good policy response to homelessness, but to date there hadn't been uh, an in-depth evaluation of its effects. So we aim to assess the success of this new housing options approach, its impact on statutory homelessness, what outcomes are achieved for people seeking help from local authorities through this thematic inquiry approach. And this is about, about getting a national picture on whether housing options is an effective way to prevent homelessness. It might be worthwhile to, to, to state that there has been a very positive response from stakeholders to our recommendations in the thematic inquiry report. We published our findings with recommendations on the 9th of May. And those recommendations within the report are, are focused on the Scottish Government and, and councils. The intent with the report is that it does act as a catalyst for improvement and the immediate reaction uh, from stakeholders to the report has been positive and we have um, we've been encouraged by how the, the key stakeholders, the Scottish Government, Alacho and COSL and Bath local authorities have, have already committed to using the report to improve how the delivery of housing options in Scotland, they've accepted our recommendations and are already making progress in implementing the recommendations. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, can you provide maybe a brief overview of why you undertook the study and the methodology that you used to carry it out? We were um, conscious that the housing options had uh, been um, taken up by many local authorities uh, as a, a, a response to and an approach to dealing with the prevention of homelessness and we knew that there wasn't a, although there were there were views expressed and some, some uh, studies done on housing options there hadn't been uh, an in-depth uh, 
national evaluation on the effectiveness of housing options and therefore we wanted to uh, to look at that um, particularly um, we in terms of our methodology for the for the for the thematic inquiry we were looking at gathering evidence from a wide range of sources we looked at and analyzed national um, performance and statistical information we reviewed what had what, what other research and studies uh, were, had, had said about housing options. We looked in depth and on site at the actual delivery of housing options in six case study local authorities. So we saw what actually happened, um, and that included reviewing 280 uh, housing option cases, shadowing 60 interviews by the local authority with people who were seeking their assistance. We have tenant assessors who work with us as well, and they carried out a mystery shopping exercise. So they actually went, they phoned um, local authorities uh, as if they were looking for uh, assistance. Um, we also surveyed the other 26 local authorities who hadn't been, who weren't the six case study local, uh, case study local authorities. So that gave us that, that national profile and that, that national picture. Um, we had also used uh, and built on the findings from um, inquiries that we carried out in recent years with individual local authorities around, around homelessness. Uh, we also discussed with a range of, of stakeholders what their views were. And so all of that fed into uh, the evidence base that we used for, for the thematic inquiry report. Um, it's perhaps just worth saying that we used the findings from the case studies, the six case studies, at an aggregate level um, to inform our assessment of the success of, of housing options nationally. We didn't report on each council's performance. OK, thank you. Um, your report describes that local authorities are at varied stages uh, in their development of the housing options approach. Um, you know, how wide is that variation that exists between local authorities? And, you know, obviously it's kind of a snapshot. We had did a snapshot when we did our homelessness inquiry, I suppose, and for example, most in, uh, local authorities seem to be improving, but in, I think, Scottish Borders, East Renfrewshire, I think it was, and Murray, the uh, homelessness have gone up. Murray was one of the mm -hmm. the um, one places that we undertook mm -hmm. our study and was one mm -hmm. of the beacons of, mm -hmm. of what was happening. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we, we s certainly found... Um, variation uh, within uh, or across the, the, the local authorities. Housing options is a relatively new approach. There isn't a national um, set of guidelines to, to direct and support local authorities and how they deliver um, uh, housing options w uh, within the, the homelessness prevention service. So we certainly found that local authorities were developing their own individual approaches. So that, that varied also um, it's dependent on how each local authority actually delivers its homelessness services um, how that how in housing options was integrated within uh, th those services um, certainly most local authorities were very enthusiastic about the potential for housing options to make a difference uh, to the outcomes that, that homeless people could um, uh, could get uh, enthusiastic about it as a as a really positive way to give people good advice, uh, genuine genuine choices. Um, it's it, we found it because it's it's a relatively uh, new approach um, that there wasn't that consistency that tends to develop over 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 time. Um, we found that some local authorities were more advanced. Um, in the development of, of housing options, uh, others had yet to, to, to fully fully implement it. And although some local authorities have been coming together to share um, good practice, um, to share lessons from from their own um, experiences, we saw that there was clearly a much further potential uh, to do even more if there was a national framework and national guidance to support local authorities. Okay, thank you. Um, Mark. Thank you. Just a, a couple of questions on housing options um, in practice. Just to ask what have been the main changes that local authorities 
have made to their services and moving towards a housing options approach to tackling homelessness? Um, we're certainly seeing, a, a, as I say, a variety and range of ways that, that local authorities um, were, were, were using to deliver housing options in, in practice. Um, we were seeing evidence of really good links and referral arrangements to other council services and to other agencies. Some local authorities made good use of mediation services to try and achieve appropriate outcomes for people. We also found that most local authorities had changed their officers' roles and responsibilities with, with the introduction of, of housing options uh, to ensure that there was a greater focus on prevention work. We found that homelessness officers generally received training on housing options service delivery, um, but this wasn't always the case for initial reception staff, who are sometimes the first person that, that uh, someone approaching the council would, would see. Um, Housing options practitioners were also making use of the Scottish government's um, or the Scottish government funded housing option hubs, um, and these hubs uh, bring practitioners together um, to um, to share um, good practice to, uh, and to develop uh, new ideas for delivering housing options. And um, so, local authorities were make, <coughs> were making use of, of those hubs uh, to develop new 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 approaches and share approaches that they found had worked uh, in their authorities. But there was certainly a range a range of, of methods and approaches. Okay, it's good to, to hear about that range of methods and how how they've been used to, to tackle homelessness. But the report um, identified uh, quite a lack of clear and consistently applied recording of outcomes and housing options, mm -hmm. which has been a major barrier to evaluating the success of the approach both locally and nationally. Mm -hmm. um, are you able to, to give us any details on where you felt the inadequacy was in the reporting of those outcomes and how it affected the ability you had to carry out um, the study and where improvements can be made so that the, the list of measures that you mentioned can be properly monitored yes. to see which have been most effective. I, um, absolutely. We, we certainly did find that uh, the lack of that national um, set of, of, um, of statistics around the outcomes achieved through housing uh, through housing options really placed a limitation on the type of analysis that we could that we could uh, carry out. Um, there there was a lack of clear and consistently applied recording of outcomes um, in house, in housing options, and that has been a major barrier in being able to to evaluate um, the success of, or, or, or or effectiveness of the approach both locally and and nationally. We certainly found that um, local authorities were um, implementing their own approaches to recording their own local outcomes. Um, again, there was there was variation in how that was that was that was being done. Um, so you wouldn't be able to see consistency even across local methods of of recording outcomes. Um, the the local authorities we spoke to recognised that. Their, uh, their monitoring of outcomes was an area where they needed to improve. They also um, recognised that um, there was a, a vacuum there in terms of a, a, a national monitoring framework that they could um, uh, contribute to. But what has what has happened since um, uh, since we were on site and since, since our, uh, we were looking at, at this, was that the Scottish Government on the 1st of April introduced a, a mandatory data collection on monitoring housing options um, outcomes. And that's effective from, I say, from the 1st of April. I think is, we recognise it was a really important, a really timely development. Uh, and it will actually now support the proper evaluation of uh, the effectiveness of, of housing options. I think that's a really important development. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, Mary, you've got yes, um, some questions. Thank you. Good evening and good morning. I want to follow on the questions around um, options and reporting and, and guidance because <coughs> your report has identified a tension between local authority duties to homeless persons and housing options. And the Scottish Government um, 
has produced guidance which makes it clear that local authorities should complete a homeless assessment for any person homeless or threatened with homelessness at the time of the auctions interview. But I wanted to um, explore a bit further about why did you find that this advice was not always being followed? <coughs> What we found when we were on site um, was that um, there was that awareness of the high-level guidance that had been provided back in 2009 uh, through a joint publication uh, by the Scottish Government and COSLA. Um, but it was a fairly highly high-level statement um, that was provided. There was little um, further detail uh, on how uh, the development of housing options should accommodate um, the, the requirements of the homelessness legislation. Uh, and I think the, the, the Scottish Government actively promoted um, local development of approaches um, to ensure that there was innovation and um, that those approaches were relevant to the local context. Um, I th what, what we did find, though, was that that meant that officers <coughs> on the ground, um, while they were aware of the, the high-level um, um, objective, weren't always clear uh, and what that meant when somebody approached them, whether they should pursue a housing options approach or take them down the route of, of a homelessness application. Uh, and it was that confusion that led um, to variation in practice. Okay. Because, I mean, around half of all local authorities have said there is a need for more guidance. Yes. Um, and, and Shelter have asserted that the absence of national guidance um, in housing options had resulted in, in a gap in, in, in areas. Do you think putting guidance on a, a national, um, a mandatory footing would, would close that gap? Yes. Um, we think it's important that there is both clear guidance um, and then an effective monitoring framework. Um, as my colleague has, has, has said, we, we now have half of that in place uh, with the introduction of the mandatory monitoring framework by the Scottish Government on the 1st of April. Um, we do think that, that given what we have found uh, in terms of the variation, uh, both within local authorities and across local authorities, that there is a need for clearer guidance. Uh, we're also very uh, mindful of the fact that the Code of Guidance on Homelessness, which okay. uh, is the broader set of guidance available yeah. to local authorities to uh, assist them in the delivery of their, their homelessness duties, um, has not been updated uh, uh, meaningfully since 2005. Um, so I think there's a real opportunity here to uh, put in place clear guidance uh, that will assist local authorities to deliver um, uh, effective housing options and effective housing options that enables them to um, appropriately discharge their statutory duties around homelessness. So if a review was done in the two 2005 guidance and was updated, that would, that would make a, a big difference? Well, uh, again, this would be, for I think, for the Scottish Government mm. uh, in discussion with, with COSLA um, and Alacho as to whether that was the best mm. vehicle to get appropriate guidance for housing options. It seems um, to us sensible that there is um, a, an eye given to the broader homelessness guidance uh, when you're bringing forward specific guidance around housing options and how it relates to um, those homelessness statutory duties. Okay, thanks. And are you able to comment on the specific impact that the removal of the priority, non-priority need distinction between homeless applicants has had on local authority practice towards potentially homeless people? The Inquiry which we undertook was specifically aimed at um, identifying the impact of housing options mm. on uh, prevention of homelessness. Um, now, the prevention of homelessness was absolutely seen as a, an important way to address um, the delivery of the 2012 target around the removal of, of, of um, non-priority um, from for homeless people. Um, the, the target in terms of the published statistics and uh, the Scottish Government's position on that is that yeah, that, that has been an important factor um, in achieving um, the target. Um, what, what we found was that um, there were, um, on a number of occasions, uh, individuals who um, were dealt with through housing options who had a fairly clear prima facie 
evidence of, of, of homelessness um, and a homelessness assessment wasn't taken. Now, they may have achieved an outcome that was appropriate uh, and that dealt with their, their housing need. Um, but this is why we, we have made the, uh, the statement in the report that we did identify um, uh, a level of under-reporting of homelessness mm -hmm. uh, as a consequence of uh, local authorities dealing with people through the housing options route. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. That's covered up. Thank you. Okay, um, Alex. I'm going to move on to uh, looking at some practical examples, if that's okay. So, in the first instance, can you give us some good examples of practice and housing options that led to positive outcomes for people? Yeah, we did we did find uh, some some good um, positive practice examples, which actually highlighted uh, in in the report. Um, we saw good early intervention work um, to actually prevent homelessness. Um, and that was particularly in cases involving people with private sector tenancies and those who owned the, the, their own homes. Local authorities were able to offer advice, uh, make referrals to other agencies, including the local authorities' own benefit service, um, and to mortgage to rent schemes for owners uh, who are in financial difficulties. Um, we specifically highlighted, again, as one of, a, one of the positive practice examples, um, Falkirk Council, which uses its debt and welfare advice team to work with owner occupiers who are in mortgage arrears and uh, threatened with eviction as a result of that. And again, it uses the Scottish Government's mortgage to rent uh, scheme to convert mortgages to, to rent. So this prevented an eviction and prevented homelessness uh, take, taking place. Um, we also saw that some people got settled accommodation outcomes that they were, they were satisfied with through housing options, either in a local authority house or a registered social landlord house, let through the mainstream uh, housing list or a, a house in, in the private sector. And for many of them, this was a positive outcome. So we did see good examples of that, of housing options in practice, having the, the, right, sort of, you know, the right sort of effect in terms of an appropriate outcome. Mm -hmm. The, there must, of course, have been some less positive outcomes that you came across. I wondered if you could tell us about some of these examples uh, where, uh, and how these outcomes could have been improved? Uh, certainly some people uh, didn't get um, solutions to their housing problems and didn't get the type of, of positive outcome that they might have achieved if they had received a homelessness assessment. Were local authorities to carry out an assessment of homelessness and housing options together, which is what was recommended in the 2009 Scottish Government and COSLA guidance, that would have resolved um, the weaknesses in many of the cases we, we reviewed. Mm. I'm also interested to know what role you registered social landlords play in the housing options approach. Uh, and how can they, uh, they achieve good outcomes for people? The, this, this, in this thematic, we, we focused particularly on local authorities um, and their role in mm. relation to, to, to housing options and, and homelessness prevention. We, we do have some statistics on, on RSL um, role and their, their contribution, and we know that they're contributing 37% of social sector housing outcomes for homeless applicants and most recently the, the figures for the final quarter of 2013 that equated to approximately 1,500 RSL tenancies compared to 2,500 local authority tenancies. Mm -hmm. On the basis of uh, your experience in preparing this report you've recommended that the Scottish Government should produce further guidance on housing options. What are the key issues you think that guidance should cover? I think the principal um, issue that we uh, recommend that it covers is uh, the provision of advice to local authorities on how they can deliver housing options um, services and meet their statutory duties around homelessness. And I think it's about removing the, um, the, the, the lack of clarity on how those two things um, can effectively uh, 
um, operate side by side. Um, within within our report, we set out a range of other recommendations that we think can be tackled through um, the provision of of clear guidance. But I would say that's that's the critical one, and that's certainly the one which um, over half of local authorities um, stated to us they felt there was a need uh, for much greater clarity on. Thank you very much. Can I just follow up on that? Um, you know, you said it was mainly c uh, councils and, and their council housing um, rather than registered social landlords playing a part. Um, but if we take Glasgow, for example, it doesn't have its own housing. Um, it's all um, with uh, registered social landlords. So in that particular case, is there a particular problem? I mean, I recall few months ago um, an article saying that that Glasgow wasn't really meeting its obligations to homelessness. Now I don't believe everything I read in the paper but you know is that perhaps the case there or? Specifically with, with regard to Glasgow we've actually been engaging with, um, with the City Council um, around uh, it's it's acknowledged difficulties in, 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 in terms of its delivering a um, appropriate accommodation, uh, temporary accommodation and another accommodation for uh, uh, for, for homeless, um, potential ho homeless people. Um, the council has committed to improve, to make the improvements that it needs, it needs to do. It's, it has uh, committed to, and it has put in place interim measures uh, to, um, to deal with uh, those difficulties while it, it implements a longer term um, sustainable uh, set of improvements to its homeless service to ensure that those difficulties are addressed. So has the council got accommodation or does it still rely on social landlords? It, it has a mix. Um, it certainly will, uh, it will have, a, it has arrangements in place with um, social landlords, the RSLs within the city, with other landlords and it has um, access to other accommodation which it makes use of uh, for um, you know for temporary accommodation purposes as well. Okay. Um, shall we move on to temporary accommodation then, uh, itself with Gordon? Um, your report highlights that there has been a general decrease in the use of temporary accommodation from its peak in 2010-11 of 11,264 households, and I understand that the final quarter of 2013 suggests that that number is down to 9,963. Given as a range of reasons why people are provided with temporary accommodation, are you able to identify the underlying reason for this 11% reduction over this period? We, we certainly observed and were aware of that, that downward trend in the use of temporary accommodation by, by local authorities. What we weren't seeing, and this may answer your question, we weren't always seeing effective strategic planning by local authorities around the level of temporary accommodation that was, that was required. Uh, we found that some local authorities had actually reduced the provision of their own properties for temporary accommodation. We weren't necessarily seeing the links uh, between that reduction and um, uh, the, 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 pl the planning and requirements around the, the actual need for, for temporary accommodation. So it wasn't always clear how those decisions were, 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 were relating to the level of demand for temporary accommodation uh, were, 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 were being uh, fed through into reducing uh, the actual level of, of temporary accommodation. Um, so this is actually, for some local authorities, reducing the availability and choice of, te of temporary accommodation and it may make it more difficult, uh, therefore, to meet the needs of, of people in the future. There are also differences between local authorities about uh, the provision of, of temporary accommodation to people who they had assessed as homeless and those who they were taking through uh, the housing options route as well. So, so would that suggest that there's, there's no um, evidence to suggest that assessments have been done quicker than before or that settled accommodation hasn't been found quicker or that there is less intentionally homeless? From what you're saying is that you know there, there may not be providing enough temporary accommodation. What, what we're saying is that the, the 
there wasn't that clear evidence of um, strong effect of planning uh, for the provision of temporary accommodation based on a clear understanding and assessment of the level of need and demand. Um, it is probably worth saying that the, the reductions in uh, the level of usage of temporary accommodation do to a degree mirror the reduction in the number of applications mm -hmm. that are being dealt with by local authorities. So you could conclude that there's a there's a logic in that yeah. um, uh, in terms of that mirroring um, and uh, it's undoubtedly the case that if you are effective at preventing homelessness mm -hmm. then you will reduce the level of of need or, and demand for temporary accommodation um, I think what we have identified through this report though is that there is the um, uh, there is some evidence that it, certainly some of that reduction may be because people are being diverted from the homelessness application route mm -hmm. into the housing options route and therefore temporary accommodation is not being made available where perhaps it would have been required. But, but ultimately, uh, irregardless of, of what route they go down, they are being found accommodation. Not everyone. Uh, has been found accommodation, as, as my colleague said earlier, some of the outcomes that were achieved through housing options um, were less favourable uh, and probably less favourable than they would have been had the person been dealt with through the homelessness statutory framework. Um, so it, I, I think it would be um, uh, uh, correct to say that the, uh, the outcomes um, were not always what um, uh, they should have been for every individual that was dealt with through housing options. So uh, are there any uh, findings that you, you had in your report which would improve the use of temporary accommodation? As my colleague has, has said, the, the, the focus of the inquiry um, was very much around the operation of housing options. We, we, we touched on, on temporary accommodation as far as it related into housing options and the provision of it. So we haven't made direct recommendations um, uh, in terms of uh, temporary accommodation in itself. Um, we do engage with um, local authorities on an individual basis through the, um, the shared risk assessment uh, process that we undertake with our um, scrutiny partners, uh, such as Audit Scotland. Um, and through that, where we identify a requirement um, in a local authority for improvements around temporary accommodation, we'll pick that up in the direct engagement with that local authority. And are there any steps you're taking to monitor the quality of temporary accommodation provided by local authorities? Not, not. Uh, I mean, we do look at those those um, figures as part of the the shared risk assessment when we annually look at local authorities' um, performance in terms of their their, their duties and, and their responsibilities. We also make use of the Scottish government statistical returns. It, it, it's statistics uh, that it gathers through, through its returns from local authorities and that includes temporary accommodation um, figures as well. Okay, thanks. Yes. Uh, thank you for being here. Good morning. Um, following on from my colleague's questions on temporary accommodation, obviously the foundation of your important function as the housing regulator is of course the Scottish Social Housing Charter and one of the outcomes in that states that local councils perform their duties on homelessness so that homeless people get prompt and easy access to help and advice are provided with suitable good quality temporary or emergency accommodation when this is needed. How do you measure whether or not the accommodation that is being provided by local authorities is uh, good quality? Because you'll be aware of the evidence from Shelter Scotland that despite the significant decrease in the number of families being placed in temporary bed and breakfast accommodation since the legislation was introduced in 2004, there are still a small number um, of fa families, particularly uh, pregnant women and children, being placed in accommodation that is not wind and water tight. So how do you actually measure the quality in order to meet um, the outcome um, specified in your own charter? It's probably worth saying that the um we have just concluded the, um, the collection of the first round of uh, performance information on the, the social housing charter. Uh, landlords uh, were required to provide us with that um, by the end of May. So we'll now be analysing that information um, and reporting that back out 
um, to tenants and to the wider public. Um, uh, we're aiming to do that by the end of August. Um, so that will be the first time we've had um, a comprehensive data set on landlords' performance against the Charter. What we will then do with that information is use that, along with uh, a range of other information and intelligence that we gather uh, 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 through the shared risk assessment to identify which local authorities we may need to engage further with to understand better how they're performing. Um, in terms of, of, of um, temporary accommodation and the quality of that accommodation, um, the reality is that the, the, the only really effective approach to uh, assessing that quality is, is direct inspection. Mm -hmm. So we would undertake that where we have identified that there may be a risk that local authorities are failing to deliver on the quality and we'll take account of a range of different information that comes our way mm -hmm. um, to ensure that we understand where, where that risk is. So there will be a range of activity that will flow out of our shared risk assessment process that may very well include engaging with a number of local authorities around the quality of the temporary accommodation that they're providing. Okay. And do you, have you had any discussions with Shelter Scotland on the specific issue of temporary accommodation? Uh, we have fairly regular conversations with um, Shelter, uh, both at a strategic level um, and also when we are engaging directly with a particular um, local authority. Um, we would view Shelter as an important stakeholder uh, and also a, a, a useful source of intelligence in terms of the work that Shelter does on the ground through um, a range of its projects and its um, housing advice centres. Um, so we have had um, um, a range of conversations with Shelter um, on, on these kind of topics. Okay, thank you. Okay, Adam. Uh, thank you, convener. On the face of it, um, I was concerned to, to read about the, what appeared to be an inappropriate diversion of people uh, away from the provision of homelessness service to, to the housing options approach. Now, my understanding was that under the regulations, um, local authorities had a, a housing support duty that requires local authorities to assess where appropriate the housing support needs of homeless applicants to whom they have a duty to secure settled accommodation. So why, why was this not kicking in um, when people who were, to all intents and purposes, as you pointed out yourself, were homeless? I think, I think it's important to um, understand the different assessment routes that local authorities are, are considering here. Um, the duty around um, support needs uh, relatively new, introduced in the summer of last year. Um, and we did see some good examples of, of local authorities ensuring that um, the, the, the support needs of, of individuals approaching them uh, were uh, being fully assessed um, and that appropriate responses were being put in place. I think, again, the, the, the difficulty arose here where um, uh, local authorities were making decisions about whether a, an individual was dealt with as a homeless person yeah. or through the housing options route. And where it was through the housing options route, it wasn't always clear that the requirements around the assessment of support needs uh, would, would, would kick in uh, and that that would happen. So again, I think this comes back to the point we made earlier um, and our recommendation around clear guidance um, to ensure that local authorities understand and are assisted um, uh, to, to provide the appropriate assessments at the appropriate point uh, for each individual that approaches them. Okay. So was this... Was this a consistent finding across the country you had, or was it um, some local authorities were, were, were doing the appropriate thing and others were not? Is that, is that what you're saying? Is that, is that because of lack of clarity in the guidance? It, it wasn't a consistent finding. Uh, we found um, in uh, a number of councils that they were doing very effectively um, joint assessments uh, around homelessness, housing options and support needs, right. um, that all of these assessments were happening um, uh, at, at the same point. Uh, uh, we highlight within the report one council, for example, that uh, ensured that in every case uh, 
uh, the, the, the support needs assessment was happening for uh, all individuals. Um, so it's certainly not a consistency issue. And again, I think that brings us back to the, uh, the point of, of clarity um, to ensure that that consistency is there um, across all local authorities. So that kind of best practice that you mentioned there, that's what, uh, that's what we're aiming for across the country and every local authority. Well, we've certainly highlighted it as positive practice in the report. Okay, thank you. Okay, and Jim? Um, you've highlighted in your report the fact that there are no national available statistics on the outcomes people achieve through housing options, and you state in page 13 of your report, and I quote, the lack of clear and consistently, consistently applied recording of outcomes in housing options has been a major barrier to evaluating the success of the approach, both locally and nationally. How important is it that we are now moving towards mandatory data collection, and uh, what difference do you think that will make? I, mean, I, th I think it, it, will, it, will, it will give um, policy makers and uh, stakeholders um, real evidence about uh, about how, or housing op how, how housing options has been delivered in practice. Mm -hmm. It will allow the policy to be evaluated based on statistical information, um, which um, is collecting um, details of, of who of who is applied. Um, household characteristics, reasons for application, prevention activity, and very importantly, outcome as well. So that's going to, to give uh, a, a real set of, of, of important uh, evidence uh, about uh, about housing options and will allow a real national uh, evaluation of, of its implementation. Mm -hmm. I mean, at the moment, I think one of the, uh, the things is that there's an inconsistency in the approach undertaken by different local authorities. Do you see that? Improving. I, th I think with both the the monitoring framework and with uh, what's potentially going to be developed by Scottish government and others in terms of national guidance, those are the two things which clearly came out of uh, our thematic inquiry as the things which which were needed. One of those is is in place or and, and will and will uh, start to deliver um, the statistical information and. We have a commitment uh, from Scottish Government and uh, local council bodies um, on developing the national guidance. So those two things uh, will, will make, I think, a real difference uh, to how local authorities actually consistently uh, deliver housing options in an effective way. I mean, the mandatory requirement has been introduced from April of this year. Do we have guidance yet to accompany that? There's, there's guidance to... Uh, Around around what statistics need to be um, provided for that for that for that new monitoring framework, um, so that that should be um, uh, collected consistently and and provide and submitted uh, in a consistent fashion. The guidance itself around how how uh, housing options should should be d delivered, uh, how that's done on the, on the front line by by staff and different in different local authorities, that's the thing that's, that's still to be developed, but we have com very positive commitments uh, from Scottish Government and uh, local authority bodies to do that. And in fact, uh, we're aware of, of really early progress being made uh, to to develop that, that guidance. Okay, that, that distinction, that clarification is uh, useful and helpful, thank you. Uh, can I just ask you finally about your own monitoring work as the regulator? How do you see that? Um, tying in with the new requirements, particularly in relation to the, the Charter and, and those indicators that relate specifically to homelessness and housing advice? Mm -hmm. I mean, we will be, uh, we're, we're just in the first year of, of, the, of, of the Charter. We've got the information uh, submitted uh, to us um, as of the for last year, uh, as of the first of June, which will be, which we are in the process of analysing, we also rely on uh, statistics which are collected by the Scottish Government from local authorities. So we'll use those statistics as well to um, to review local authority performance against the charter uh, outcomes, and that will feed into what my colleague mentioned as the, the shared risk assessment process mm -hmm. for each local authority and that will, that will give us what, um, what our 
prior regulatory priorities are uh, to uh, focus on for for individual local authorities in the coming year. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Can I just ask? Um, you say uh, in that uh, in undertaking this inquiry, you had feedback from discussions with a range of stakeholders. Were some of these stakeholders uh, people who'd actually pitched up at their local council, um, saying that they were homeless? Um, and you know how they felt they were being, they had been dealt with, and how their problem had been dealt with um, through the housing options route, rather than, than perhaps traditionally might have expected. The the stakeholders uh, were, were referring to within the report were um, stakeholder representative bodies, mm. such as such as shelter uh, and and similar uh, similar bodies. We we. As part of our case studies, we observed um, interviews within local authorities where homeless people or people who were, who were saying that they had that they were, they were potentially homeless um, were being um, uh, interviewed and uh, spoken to by, by by the council. So we had that very direct um, evidence from people who were approaching the councils and going through the council's housing options or, or homelessness assessment route. Okay, does anyone else have any further questions? Okay, uh, thank you very much um, thank you. for being with us this morning. That's been uh, very helpful. Uh, thank you for your attendance. And at this point, we move into private session as previously agreed. We can have a short couple of minutes break.